Well, greetings to you. I return to Ukraine to talk about uh, the military situation, as I promised I would. Now, let's just look at military struggles historically just for a moment. What we have to understand and what history tells us, military history tells us, is that modern warfare is a battle now of titanic economies industrial economies and one of the reasons of course that the Japanese uh, failed in the last war was that they couldn't possibly keep up with the industrial might of the United States. The United States then, not like now, was a huge manufacturing country, massive, uh, difficult to imagine uh, these days but it was really huge, made in America, big manufacturing base. So it wasn't possible for the Japanese to win that. It's very difficult indeed for a country which isn't a big economic power, an industrial base, to actually take on uh, another country which is. And this is one of the problems uh, that NATO are facing in the Ukraine. Now that uh, is just a matter of historical fact. And of course the Great War dragged on and on and on because it was a clash between two big industrial power bases, which was uh, the Allies and the British Empire uh, and Germany, which was a very significant industrial power uh, in 1914. Uh, and it made the war last a very long time. And the result was basically inevitable, although it took four years and uh, millions and millions of dead to actually achieve uh, a not very satisfactory peace. So it's a question of industrial might. And now where we are uh, in the Russian Federation against the Ukraine, we have a situation which has taken a lot of people rather by surprise. And that is that Russia now has a very much more effective industrial base than the United States. And there's been miscalculation on the need for ammunition and weapons on the basis of NATO, because NATO have never ever been uh, up against a sophisticated enemy. Uh, an, an enemy which has uh, a, a similar power base, industrial power base, and similar sophistication of weaponry. Uh, and what's been uh, far frightening, if you like, for the Americans is that the so-called sophistication of their weaponry is not actually as sophisticated as the Russian Federation. Uh, their, uh, uh, their rockets and their uh, air warfare uh, artillery bases, uh, satellite-driven uh, artillery bases, and so on and so forth, are actually more effective in many cases than that available to NATO. And NATO has it in far fewer numbers. And this is now coming home to roost. And if you add the significant uh, advantage in Russian manpower and shorter logistical lines... Uh, that the Russian Federation has, you can see that it is not possible for Ukraine to win this war, this proxy war, because everything has to come from the United States, or most weaponry has to come from the United States. Uh, and that's long, and the Russian Federation has a very much shorter supply chain. And logistics is something I know a little bit about. I spent several years uh, with 4th Armoured Division uh, in logistics. Uh, and it's an interesting phenomenon. Some of the sophisticated uh, aeroplanes that NATO has are actually not suited even to what's going on now. So, for example, we have uh, F-16s. Well, the F-16 is really only capable of flying uh, off pristine airfields. Uh, uh, it needs a, 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 a base from which to take off. You can't sort of hack an airfield out of, uh, out of uh, rough country uh, with an F-16. It needs a very sophisticated base from which to fly. And of course, they could be flown from Polish uh, aerodromes and other NATO aerodromes. But of course, that's a very serious escalation because some of these aeroplanes are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And so what the Russians would then say is, just a minute, the, if you base them... Uh, in Poland or Romania, uh, they're capable of carrying nuclear weapons and we can't allow that to happen. Uh, so it's going to escalate the war. 
let's look at the numbers of bodies on the ground. Well, we have an efficient uh, and I would imagine quite brave Polish army, uh, because historically that's, uh, that's what they are, uh, a, a brave nation and, and, and brave soldiers. My father served with them uh, in the Air Force in the last war, so we know that to be true. And my father-in-law uh, commanded a tank with 1st Polish Armoured uh, Division in Normandy. So I know how brave they are, but they are still very small. There is a very small industrial base in Poland, uh, and their army is relatively small by Russian standards. Uh, Russians have something like three to 400,000 men in arms that they can mobilize with short supply trains straight away. It's there, it's already in, uh, 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 within Russia on the Ukraine border and in the, in, in the east and the Belarusian border. So we know that they're there. Uh, I was a guest of the United States um, Air Force uh, a few years ago now, but uh, we look at the things like the F-35. These are very, very complicated uh, and sophisticated airborne weapon systems. But the command of the air at the moment uh, is with the Russian Federation. So these uh, fighter aircraft and fighter bomber aircraft the way things are stacked at the moment wouldn't last long in theatre. And it also begs the question, who wants to release their F-35s or the F-16s from any of the NATO countries uh, to be sacrificed probably in Ukraine? And where are the pilots going to come from? Uh, I was in uh, at a base a few years ago. It takes a long time, certainly, to train uh, pilots on F-16s and F-35s. A long time. Uh, never mind the uh, language barrier that, of course, you would probably have uh, with Ukrainian pilots. This isn't going to happen. It's wishful thinking. And uh, let's have a look at how many uh, boots on the ground the Americans have. Well, they have 3rd Armoured Division, which is based in Poland, and they have uh, also 101 uh, Airborne, uh, which is a very uh, good fighting unit with a uh, fantastic history of uh, fun history. It's elite is like our parachute regiment. Uh, it, it, it's that kind of elite, but it's very small. It's very small. And it's not geared for a major conflict of this nation, all arms conflict of this nation. Basically, it's light infantry. Uh, and that's no good. They wouldn't get far enough. Uh, they wouldn't get uh, into, the Amer uh, into the Russian Federation line. So that's not an operational uh, option at all. It's just, it's not an option. So you could have those troops there and still it's frighteningly small from a NATO perspective. If the war escalates, uh, it's not going to make any difference. 100,000 men in, in Poland, or uh, if you add uh, Poland, a couple of hundred thousand, even motivated and well-trained equipment, in the big picture, sounds a lot, but in the big, big picture, without the support uh, of unlimited industrial uh, backup when it comes to uh, artillery rounds, uh, and bombs, and so on and so forth. And of course, Biden said the reason he's sending these cluster bombs is because he's run out of ammunition. There's no ammunition. This isn't a conspiracy theory or anything like that. And I'm neither pro one nor pro the other. It's just a question of how it is. You just stack up the numbers. So no good can come of this. No good can come of this. I just want to cover another thing, something which is quite uh, in interesting. Uh, NATO. Now, We've got a proxy war going on here with NATO. NATO has a proxy. Uh, it's been heavily armed uh, in Ukraine, but they've gone now. The first time is gone. The second time is gone. They're now scraping the barrel uh, with enforced conscription. People are fleeing the country. I think it's a war that the Ukrainian people simply don't want, uh, which is why they're leaving the country in very big numbers. And I think it's also the reason uh, that Zelensky has suspended uh, elections, because I think if he actually put it to the people, do you want this war to continue? I think the answer would be a resounding no. In the same way, I think if you put it to uh, an awful lot of people uh, in NATO countries that do you want war or potential uh, world war with the Russian Federation, they will also say the same thing. No, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, now, Article 5 isn't quite as clear as a lot of people imagine. Uh, and if you look it up, it's easy enough to Google the uh, NATO, uh, the treaty, uh, Article 5. You are not committed as a NATO member to go to war if somebody invades another NATO country. You are committed to act uh, in a manner that is coercive to support uh, of that nation. You are not obliged to put troops on the ground 
or supply anything in particular. It's suitably vague. Um, you need to look it up. It says, deemed such action as to be necessary. Deemed such action to, as to be necessary. That's vague enough. And given that NATO has now run out of kit, run out of ammo, run out of just about everything because they've miscalculated what you need for an all arms major war and the Russian war machine is in full tilt, the only option now can be a negotiated peace. It's in everybody's interest, particularly the Ukrainian people. It has to end with a negotiated peace. Or if it grinds along further, it just means there'll be more young Ukrainian and indeed Russian lives lost to no purpose. Just like the war in the Great War could have been finished or, or negotiated uh, end in 1916, it went on for another two years for the cost of millions of lives. This, in my view, is criminally negligent and we should sit round a table now. And in order to do that, we need to get rid of the warmongers in Washington. We need to get rid of Jen Stoltenberg, who is the Secretary General of NATO, uh, who is largely responsible for actually signing the letter that started this war, uh, if you look like to look that one up as well. We have to change uh, the people in the West and the neocons who will not negotiate, have said they will not negotiate under any circumstances. We have to get rid of them and put people in who are prepared to negotiate it. Moreover, that the Russian Federation can trust in negotiation, which at the moment, after Minsk, they can't do. Sooner or later, this is going to have to happen. And every week that goes by, unnecessary young lives and indeed now civilian lives are going to be lost. Stop it and stop it now. Uh, as most of you know, my work is very heavily independently research-based uh, and I get my information from all over the world. It would help if you press the subscribe button and the little bell next to it because the more subscribers I have, uh, the more likely it is that international uh, independent research institutes will share their material with me. It's most helpful and then of course I'll automatically share it with you. Uh, so, surprise, won't cost you anything. Uh, thank you very much.